Thank you for joining us for Old Testament Survey. We are in part two, which means we're in week 11. And so I want to take a moment to kind of recap what we talked about last week. And last week was all about the united monarchy. Israel had come out through the season of the judges, and they were kind of, you know, controlled and encouraged and rebuked by the judges. And then going into 1 Samuel, as we saw last week, the people of God really felt like they needed a king. Every other nation had a king, and with a king and with land, they thought that brought credibility. And so the people of God, the Israelites, wanted a king. And so we saw the rise of a united monarchy during that time. One of the problems with having a king was this, is that somewhere along the line, Israel felt like a king could succeed where maybe they felt like God had failed them. Now what you read through, you know, uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, and through the Chronicles, you, what you find out is they were absolutely wrong. That uh, a human king, that and when you put your faith in somebody, they will always let you down. And the human kings is what failed them. It was God that continued to be faithful. And so during this time of the United Monarchy, we saw really there was three kings. The United Monarchy lasted 120 years, and there was three kings during this time. The first king of Israel was King Saul. And then the second one was King David, and the last one was David's son, Solomon. Now, the ultimate shift we saw in the rise of the United Monarchy was this, and I don't want you to forget this. The ultimate shift was this, that Israel now moved from a theocracy to a monarchy. Now, remember what theocracy means. Theocracy is where they got their direct uh, encouragement, their direct guidance from Yahweh. Now, they're taking it from a king. And here's the problem with that. If the king is not a man of God, He's going to lead them down his own desires, his, the path of his own ambitions, rather than desires and the ambitions and the will of God. So what we see in Israel is this major shift with this united monarchy of moving away from a theocracy where God is the one who gives us commands, God is the one who guides us, directs us, and tells us when to go into battle, when not to, and they shifted to a monarchy, and now the king is the voice with which they will follow. And what we will find out, even as we get into next week in the divided kingdom, we'll find out that following man's leadership typically never goes well. Now, as you think about the United Monarchy, what I want us to do today is I want us to look at the, the poetry and the wisdom literature that we see in the Bible. And the reason I want to kind of take it right now at this point, right after the United Monarchy, because most of the wisdom literature and most of the poetry that we see in Scripture occurs during this time of the United Monarchy. Most of it, not all of it, most of it. And so most of the wisdom literature and the poetry like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, those are the, 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 the scripture, the, the books I'm talking about, they occur mostly during this time of the United Monarchy. Now, the book of Psalms itself uh, pretty much occurs, not all of it, but most of it occurs during what we call the Davidic period, during the time of David. You know, the, 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 during the time of David, you see a lot of different things that happen. And so most of the Psalms kind of, kind of um, I guess, chronicle or, or share the emotions of what was going on during that time. But it also, the book of Psalms can, can kind of it also includes other eras in, in Israel's history. For example, there's some Psalms that take place during the time when the kingdom was divided, which we'll get to next week. Some of the Psalms was written during the time of the Babylonian exile, when the Israelites in the southern kingdom of Judah were taken into Babylon, and, and what they felt, and what they were thinking, and their laments, and their, their anguish that they were going through while in captivity. And then you've got other Psalms that refer to time when the Israelites came back out of uh, Babylon into Jerusalem under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, and you see those psalms that reflect that season of Israel's history. And then you've even got a psalm, Psalm 90, that was written by Moses. So the psalms cover a large span of our Old Testament history, from Moses all the way to the return of Israel back into Jerusalem in the southern kingdom of Judah. But for the most part, most of the psalms that are written occurred during the time of David as a boy, as a king, as an older gentleman. So that's that. Now then you also have got the other books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, which all of these occur during what's called the Solomonic period, the time of Solomon, the, the season that he reigned and ruled and was alive. These books were written during those times. Now it's interesting that some, most scholars would contend that these three different books reflect different time periods in Solomon's life. 
For example, uh, the book of Song of Songs reflects a young Solomon, a young man's love for a woman. Then you've got Proverbs, which is more of a middle-aged man's look at life. And then you've got Ecclesiastes, which is really a reflection of an old man's sorrow. So they really look at these three books and go, they feel like that Solomon wrote them at different seasons of his life, from the time of being a young lover, uh, looking for a wife and his love for her, to a man who's experienced some life as king, but is middle-aged, to a man who's looking back on his life and drawing some really big conclusions. So that's kind of the Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and Song of Songs. Now, each one of these books of wisdom and poetry really carry different themes with them. For example, the book of Psalms carries the theme of praise through prayer. So much of the book of Psalms is prayers. It's, it's David and other people crying out to God and, and begging God and lamenting what's going on with God. It's them really, and sometimes it's, it's acts of adoration and thanksgiving, but it really is praise through prayer is the book of Psalms. And then the uh, Proverbs is all about finding prudence, you know, through precepts. Notice, how do I live my life through precepts that God has for me? And then Ecclesiastes is just all about vanity. It's about this struggle with trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment with the world. And Solomon's conclusion is, it's all in vain. Everything we do, our toil, our work, our labor, everything we do is vanity, which is not a super positive book, but that's exactly what Solomon was thinking at the time. And then you've got the Song of Songs, and the theme of that is bliss through union. And we'll get to that in a little bit more in just a minute. So what I want to do as we go through this, this wisdom literature and this, this literature of poetry is I want to take each one of these books and just kind of give us a 30,000 foot view of what the book is about, what the book entails, and just kind of the overall concept of the book. Obviously, we don't have time to walk through every single piece of every one of these books, but it is important for us to understand, okay, these mainly occur during this time of the United Monarchy a time when Israel has wanted a king, a time when Saul started as a good king, turns to a bad king, a time when David takes the throne. He was, he was, he was a shepherd boy who everybody revered, loved. He slayed Goliath. He eventually becomes king, and then he sins, and he falls, but yet he repents, and he still has a guy after God's own heart. Then you've got Solomon who's on the throne, who follows the ways of his father out of the gate. He's one of the wisest men to live in that day, but eventually he doesn't even follow his own wisdom, and he ends up doing some things and making some decisions that leads to this united monarchy becoming a divided kingdom. And so it's so important for us to understand as you read Psalms, as you read Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, for the most part, especially when it comes to Psalms, for the most part, all of these occur during this 120 years. So as you read them, hopefully that will give you a little bit of context. Now, the book of Psalms, the Hebrew word is, is Tehillim. And it means praises is what it means. Now, the book of Psalms is made up of 150 songs from Hebrew life and worship. Now, I say songs because many of these psalms were sung. They were, they were written and they were sung uh, even in the worship gatherings. Now, when you think about authorship of the book of Psalms, there are many different authors. We know for sure that David wrote 73 of 150 of the Psalms. David wrote at least 73 of them. And then Asaph, who was the chief musician, wrote 11. Then we know Solomon wrote a couple. And then like I said earlier, Moses wrote one. And then there's other authors to Psalms. So that when you think of authorship, there is not one author. So like when you read the book of Romans, Paul wrote Romans. When you read the book of Matthew, Matthew wrote Matthew, obviously, right? And so we understand that, but when we come to the Psalms, we have to understand that, yes, David was the predominant writer of it, but he didn't write everything. And that's where we understand that it covered a wider span of history than just the United Monarchy, but for the most part, most of it covered during that time. And then you've got the composition of the book of Psalms which I think is super important. If you were to take the book of Psalms and say, okay, Doug, what order is there to it? Well, how, how is the book of Psalms actually composed? And, you, and I encourage you to write this down. It's composed really in f what we would call five books. There's five aspects or five books, and, and each one of these books has a general theme. Now, there's other themes within it, but there's a general theme that these five books deal with. For example, book one would be chapters one, through 41. If you were to go through Psalms, 1 through 41 will be considered book one of this composition. And for the most part, you see the conflict between David 
and King Saul. Do you see other things? Yes, you do. But if you understand Psalms 1 through 41, a large portion of those Psalms are dealing with the conflict between David and King Saul and the anguish and the heartfelt the struggles that went through David's heart and mind. You see that during Psalms 1 through 41. And then book 2 is Psalms 42 through 72. And, to, and for the most part, those Psalms, that second book, those chapters, deal with David as king. For example, Psalms 51. We're all familiar with Psalms 51. Psalms 51 is the Psalm when David, who as he was king, uh, sinned with Bathsheba. And Psalms 51 is him crying out to God, asking God to forgive him, to renew a right spirit in him. And, and he just crying out and asking God to, for mercy and for God to cleanse him and, and to find God to look and see if there's any offensive way still in him. I mean, this Psalms 51 is David as a king crying out to a holy God. And then book three is Psalm 73 through Psalms 89, 73 through 89. And for the most part, this book three deals with the Assyrian crisis. Now, we'll get to this a little bit next week, but when the kingdom of God divided under Solomon's reign, because he, he, he ended so poorly, the kingdom was divided at the end. If you remember, uh, his servant was able to control and reign and rule over 10 of the tribes, and his son was only allowed to reign over one tribe, and the northern tribe became, uh, the northern kingdom became known as Israel, and the southern kingdom became known as Judah, and eventually because of the northern kingdom's rebellion against God, the Assyrians came in and destroyed the northern kingdom. And so when you come to chapter 73 through 89, what you find out is there's these Psalms written that heavily deal with the Assyrian crisis of this northern kingdom going to be impacted by the Assyrian people. And then in then book four is chapters 90 through 106. And really these chapters are really some, some of the most, I, I feel like, gut-wrenching, heartfelt chapters in all the book of Psalms because they are, are, are Psalms that are giving introspection to the destruction of the temple. As we've talked about with Israel's history, the temple mattered. The holy place mattered. The holy of holies mattered. I mean, the temple so represented the presence of God and the place that you could go worship God. And so when the temple was destroyed in 586 BC, I mean, it wrecked the remaining Israelites that were from the southern kingdom of Judah. It wrecked them emotionally. It wrecked them spiritually. So Psalms 90 through 106 is a lot of introspection about the destruction of that temple. And then it, the, the book of Psalms ends with chapters, book 5, which is 107 through 150. And basically these are chapters of praise and reflection on the return from exile. So once the southern kingdom in 586 is taken over by the Babylonians and the temple's destroyed, many of those Israelites are now taken to Babylon where they will be, uh, I guess, kept as slaves. The Babylonians, you can read the book of Daniel. That happens during the book of Daniel. We'll get to that in a few weeks. But, I mean, basically they take these Israelites into Babylon and try to indoctrinate them to create good Babylonians. But eventually, under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, these Israelites are able to come back to the southern kingdom, come back to Jerusalem. And so these psalms between 107 and 150 are psalms of reflection and celebration and praise about the returning from the exile in Babylon back to their home in the area of Jerusalem. So that's how the Psalms, there's five different books, that's how the books break out. Now when you're reading Psalms, you also need to know they're really kind of different classifications of Psalms. A lot, and you can write these down, I just want you to kind of be aware of this. There's some Psalms that are that are hymns, meaning they're praises and thanksgiving for all that God has done. An example of that would be like um, Psalms 8. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name. I mean, they're, they're just like hymns that are sung, that are just celebrations of who God is and what he's done. There's, there's psalms that are like that. Another classification is uh, penitential, which are psalms of confession of sin and, and asking for grace and forgiveness. Obviously, David in Psalms 51 would be a great example of that, where he confessed his sin and asked for God's cleansing and for his forgiveness. And then you've got psalms of wisdom, where wisdom that comes just on observation of life that we see. For example, Psalms 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, sorry, nor stands in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates it on it day and night. So Psalms 1, 1 starts off with this great bit of wisdom that blessed is the one who does not walk or sit in, in the seat of the sinners, 
but walks in the way of the Lord and delights himself in the Lord and the, and the law of the Lord. And so there's psalms like that. There's psalms that are considered royal psalms, like Psalms 2, a psalm that will talk about a king as being God's man, that God's hand is on that person. And then you have messianic psalms, one of the different kinds of psalms of messianic, meaning they're psalms that reflect either the person or the ministry of Jesus the Messiah who was to come. Probably one of the best examples of that is Psalms 22. That's where the psalmist says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, that's exactly what Jesus said, wasn't it, when he was on the cross? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that's a, considered a messianic psalm. It's a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to say and do when he was on the cross. And then you have what's called imprecatory uh, psalms, which imprecatory just means to curse or to swear. And basically, these are psalms where uh, people are crying out and asking God's judgment on uh, different people. A good example of that would be Psalms 35, when it says this, David wrote Psalms 35, and says, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who who fight against me. Now, what is David doing? David's crying out and asking God to step in and fight on his behalf. That would be considered an imprecatory kind of psalm. And then the psalm that we see a lot of is the last kind of classification. It's the psalms that are considered laments. These are psalms that cry out of anguish, of hurt, of sorrow, but yet also cry out still that they trust God. And we see a lot of that. In fact, there's a whole book we'll get to eventually called Lamentations, where that's exactly what it is, a book of lament. It's a book where people are crying out their sorrows to God. You do see that as well in uh, the book of Psalms, like uh, Psalms chapter 3 is a perfect example of that. So that's the different classifications of the book of Psalms, and that's the different composition of the book. Now let's move to the book of Proverbs. So we kind of have an understanding of Proverbs. And the first question we talk about Proverbs is, what is a proverb. Well, proverb is a succinct, persuasive saying proven true by experience. So it's something that's succinct, it's persuasive in nature, but it's proven true over life and experience. Now, the purpose of the book of Proverbs is very clear and it's given to us. The writer, who is Solomon, gives us the clear picture of what the purpose of the book of Proverbs is in chapter 1, verse 2 through 7. And I just want to read that to us. It says this, Verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealings, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, and knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of wise and the riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom. And instruction. So here's what Solomon says. Here's the purpose of the book of Proverbs. First of all, to know wisdom and instruction. To know what the heart of God is, how to operate in life, and how to, how to function and do the very things that God wants us to do. So to know wisdom and instruction. Another one of the purposes of Proverbs is to receive teaching in critical areas. He mentions things like dealings with people, justice, righteousness. I mean, when you look at the book of Proverbs, it gives so much insight and teachings on what does justice and just injustice look like? What does righteous living and wicked living look like? And so the pro part of the Proverbs, one of the purposes is, is to receive teachings on the crucial areas. Another purpose is to help the simple gain prudence and the youth to gain knowledge. In other words, the simple-minded, those who just kind of kind of live life on their own accord and how they want to do it to give a depth of understanding, but also the youth who lack experience to give them knowledge. And then he says, another purpose is to increase learning and to acquire the skill of understanding. You know, one thing, I've been married for 26 years, and one thing I've learned is this, there's a difference in listening to my wife and understanding what she's saying. See, listening just means I hear it, but understanding means I'm taking time to process it and to come to a conclusion about it. And all the women watching probably would say amen to that with your husbands, right? I mean, because they, they, hopefully they've understood that as well. And so the book of Proverbs is not just something about reading and, and quoting and being done with it. The book of Proverbs is something that we're to take a hold of and go, okay, this is not only going to increase my learning, but I'm going to let it process and met and set in my life and meditate on it so that I can gain a high level of understanding. And then he said there's one more really important purpose of the book of Proverbs, and that's to learn the fear of the Lord. See, he says this in verse 7, the fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of knowledge. In other words, the beginning of really being wise is having a fear of the Lord. Not the fact saying that we're scared of the Lord or that, you know, but a fear being in awe and a reverence for the Lord. Now, the book of Proverbs has three major divisions in it. If you were to look at the book of Proverbs, there are three major sections in it. The first one is what we're going to call the discourse material, or you could call it the speeches, all right? And this is from chapter 1 through chapter 9 is really where we see this. And these are speeches of instruction, speeches of exhortation. And in these speeches, we see warnings and we see admonitions. So here's some things that these speeches talk about, what it means to obey our parents and what that looks like. It talks about avoiding bad company. It talks about one of my favorite ones is Proverbs 4. It talks about pr protecting our hearts. You know, in Proverbs 4, it says, above all else, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. I mean, if you just take that and you just, you just thought about that for a minute, what is, what is Solomon saying there? He's saying above everything else in our life, the most important thing for us to do is to guard this. He says, because it's the wellspring of life. Why? Because guarding our hearts are crucial because in our hearts is where faith happens. In our hearts is where conviction happens. In our hearts is where all these things happen that spring forth joy, peace, all that comes from there. And if we don't guard it, all that can be attacked. And so in this, we see a, the, the, this admonition to protect our heart. We also see things like being faithful in relationships. Then we see things as, as, as crazy as just shunning laziness. I mean, just about not being lazy. And there's so much more here, but these first few chapters, these first nine chapters are kind of the discourse material, those speeches of warning and admonition. Ultimately, when you come to the end of these first nine chapters, here's the conclusion you're gonna to come to. That wisdom, that true wisdom, can only come from the Lord. Because when you read things like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. When you come to that, you're reminded that when I face life situation and I lean on my own understanding, where does that leave me? What does that turn out like? Well, typically it doesn't turn out well, because when Doug's left to his own devices, when I'm left to my own thoughts, my own bias, my own opinion, usually I follow my flesh. But if in all my ways I will acknowledge him and lean on him, then what will the Lord do? Make my path straight. So the conclusion you come to at the end of chapter 9 is simply this. After all these speeches, after all these warnings, after all these admonitions, the conclusion you come to is this, is that true wisdom only comes from the Lord. And if I'm going to live in this world and I'm going to operate in this world and I'm going to function in this world as a salt and light that God has called me to be, I need wisdom from the Lord. Not my wisdom, but his wisdom. And then the second major section of the book of Proverbs, which is kind of unique, is called the collection of Proverbs. It's just a collection of Proverbs. Now, that's from chapters 10 through 29. Now, the, these are Proverbs. When I say collection, I mean they weren't all written by Solomon, so to speak. Some were written by Solomon. Some were written by a guy named Hezekiah. Uh, there's one that is written by Lemuel, and there's others that write these different Proverbs during this 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 area this this these chapters but in chapters 10 through 24 are the proverbs that are written by Solomon and during these proverbs you see things like him contrasting godly living versus wicked living you see him talking about what it means to live a godly life so chapters 10 through 24 in this collection are the proverbs of Solomon and then chapters 25 through 29 you see other writers and you see people like Hezekiah who copy Solomon. So in chapters 25 through 29, we see some Proverbs of Solomon copied by Hezekiah, but we also see other Proverb writers. For example, um, in, this time for, or in, this, in this time frame, we see different things addressed in this, this collection. We see from chapter 25 through 29, things like relationships being addressed. We see relationship with other people. He talks about relationships with kings and neighbors and enemies, relationship with fools, sluggard, people that gossip, even the relationship with yourself. He's giving wisdom on that. And we also see him address, the, the, these different authors address our actions in life, our actions in law, and our actions even in wealth. And so that's kind of the collection side of Proverbs is chapter 10 through 29. And then the last section of Proverbs is called the appendices, and it's chapters 30 and 31. Now, in chapter 30, Solomon did not write these last 
these last uh, two chapters at all, but we see what's called the sayings of Agur, and in this we see him confess the need for greater wisdom. And ultimately what we see in chapter 30 is Agur addressing the idea that pride is the enemy to wisdom, and that's Psalm 30, or Proverbs 30. And then in Proverbs 31, we see the sayings of King Lemuel. And in these sayings, we see a mother's warning to a king, warning about living a life of righteousness, warning about uh, you know instilling and enforcing justice in the land. So we see the writings of King Lemuel. And then in chapter 31 of Proverbs, at the very end, we see a poem. And here's what's interesting. Scholars would look at this and they go, we have no idea who wrote the poem. But it's placed there because at the end of the book of wisdom, it brings to light this unbelievable truth that oftentimes what brings the greatest wisdom into the home is women of noble character, wives. Psalms 31 from verse 10 to the end of the, the book is really fascinating. It talks about a woman of noble character, how she's worth more than rubies and how, you know, why beauty is fleeting, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I think it's so beautiful that Solomon and the, the writer of Proverbs all ended with Proverbs 31 with saying one of the greatest vehicles to bring wisdom into the home is the women. I don't know about you, but I know this in my life and in my household, some of the greatest wisdom that has come from the Osborne household has been from my wife, Sonia. As we raised our boys, as we navigated situation with our boys, as we did life with them, as we nurtured them and guided them through how to make different decisions, some of the greatest wisdom that came derived from her. And so Psalms 31 ends with this poem of an ideal wife that's been written anonymously. So that's the book of Proverbs, those three major sections. And then that gets us to the book of Ecclesiastes. And most all scholars, I mean, really, I, there's rare scholars out there that would not say that Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, but most would say that he was very much the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. And here's the thesis of his book. All right, here's the theme for the most part of the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything is in vain. He says the vanities of vanities. Everything is meaningless. Now think about this in context of what we said earlier. If the Song of Songs, which we'll get to in a minute, is about a young love for a wife, and Proverbs is about a middle-aged man looking and, and, and you know all this wisdom that he's accrued and now he's, he's sharing it, it very much fits the idea that Ecclesiastes is an old man's sorrow. He's looking back and this is the conclusion he's making. I find it interesting because when you look at David's life, as David looked back on his life, that's when he wrote Psalms 23, right? For the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down. I mean, David was able to look back and see the disciplined hand of God, the blessing hand of God, how God was with him through the valley, the shadow of death, but how God protected him and cared for him. I mean, there's a sweetness to Psalms 23 as David looked back on his life about the beauty of what he experienced. What Solomon contends is this, everything's been meaningless. Vanity of vanities. Now, that's not super encouraging, but have we ever found ourselves in that place in life too? that we're so, we're so wrapped up and so stressed out and so just done with the wickedness of the world that it appears like no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter what's going on, that the world is getting worse and it's worse and it's worse and situations are worse and life gets worse, things get, I mean, it's just all going downhill. It's all spinning out of control. And has there been moments in our life we look at it and go, it's just all meaningless. That was where Solomon's heart was. However, here's what I want us to notice as we get into this. Why Solomon felt that way, we see glimpses throughout Ecclesiastes also of hope. Things that, while Solomon may have felt one way, he also knew the truth was something a little bit different. So let's talk about the divisions of the book of Ecclesiastes. First, there's three divisions, and the first one's in chapter 1 through chapter 2, and, 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 and actually all the way through chapter 3. And in this section, what we see, this division, we see a search for satisfaction. Solomon's looking at the world and going, okay, my, my quest for satisfaction, where can I find this satisfaction? I'm talking about this sense of fulfillment in life, that if I'm doing something that it brings ultimate satisfaction, ultimate fulfillment, ultimate peace, and, I, I, and things are good with me, where can I find that? And what we find in these first, really the first two chapters of Ecclesiastes, he says it's not found in wisdom. That wisdom doesn't bring ultimate satisfaction. You can have all the wisdom in the world and still ultimately not be satisfied. 
Now, Solomon knew that maybe better than anybody else, right? Because the end of Solomon's life, was Solomon following the way that God had led him? No. Solomon was rebelling, and Solomon, if you remember from last week, he had married foreign women. He allowed idolatry to come back in Israel. He allowed people to rebel. In fact, they got so bad that God allowed his servant to take over most of the tribes of Israel and the northern, uh, one of the kingdoms, and, the, and his, one, his son to take over one tribe to be the second kingdom. I mean, so when Solomon writes this, Solomon's just not in a good place. So he says, I'm looking at the wisdom that I have. That didn't bring satisfaction. He said, then he begins to look at like self-indulgence, like, hey, I live for my flesh, I feed my desires, anything I want, I just do it. That didn't bring satisfaction. He said, I didn't even find satisfaction in living the right way. The times that I actually did what God told me to do and lived the way that God wanted me to, I found no satisfaction. That, that didn't bring that ultimate sense of fulfillment. Can you see how bad of a place Solomon is? And then he says, even in his work, he's king. Listen. He is king of the most powerful nation in the world of that time because they had the presence of a holy God with them. And even in his work as a king, no satisfaction. So Solomon's looking at life and going, everything's meaningless. I can't be satisfied in my wisdom. I'm not satisfied in self-indulgence. I'm not satisfied in living the way God wants. There's no satisfaction in my works. And anything that I do, no satisfaction. However, whether he knew it or not, in Ecclesiastes 3, he provides a little bit of hope. Because you know what he does? In verses 1 through 8, he says stuff like this. But there's a season and a time for everything. There's a season to plant and a season to pluck that which is planted. A season of peace and a season of war. A time to dance and a time to mourn. I mean, he goes through this whole idea that ultimately he realizes that no matter what he's searching for, that ultimately God has a perfect timing. That God has a season and a reason for everything. And so when you end Ecclesiastes 3, here's the hope you kind of get. It's this idea that while he's looked at the world and said, nothing satisfies me, ultimately let my search for satisfaction lead me to the Lord. Now what was Solomon saying, even though he may not have meant it the way he said it? He's saying this, that ultimate satisfaction doesn't come in wisdom. Ultimate satisfaction doesn't come with wealth and self-indulgence. Ultimate satisfaction doesn't come in living a life like we're called to live. Ultimate satisfaction only comes in the Lord. Man, that's a beautiful picture of hope. So you go through the first two chapters of Ecclesiastes, and you just feel like, man, gloom, despair, right? You just feel like everything's, I mean, it's not definitely not motivational. I mean, it's definitely not encouraging. But in Ecclesiastes 3, it's like this idea that while he feels this way, here's what he knows to be true. Now, did you get that? Why he felt one way, what he knew was different. What he knew was, despite how he felt, God has a season and a reason for everything. And he knew that ultimate satisfaction really only came from the Lord. So that's the first division of the book. And then the second division is really the, the frustration of this life. That was really the second division of the book. It's his frustration of this life in chapters 4 through 7. In fact, if you read that, I find it fascinating because ultimately what he says is, is that life is unfair and then you die. <laughs> That's basically Solomon's conclusion in these three chapters, four through seven, is that life is just unfair and then you die. I'm tired of being a victim of oppression, of isolation, of envy, injustice. There's all this going on and I'm just sick of it. So what happens is you live and then ultimately you die. And so you can just see Solomon, once again, still not in a good place. But then we also, in that end of that chapter, we see a little bit of hope. We see that, that Solomon kind of leads us to this notion that all of prosperity and all adversity is still from God. Now, why is that important to remember that? Because, as we said in Ecclesiastes 3, God has a season and a reason for everything. So even while Solomon was able to look at the world and what he felt was, life's not fair. We live and then we die. There's injustice, there's oppression, there's isolation, there's all this wickedness going on, and that's just life, and then we die. While he felt that way, what he knew was this, is that prosperity and adversity comes from God. Now, I want you to think about something about adversity. Is it possible that God allows us to go through things because the only way he can get us to where he wants us spiritually is about allowing us to go through it? Isn't that the story of Job? Sure it is. So that is really the second division is the frustration of life. And the third division is totally different. 
From chapters 8 through 12, it's all about guidelines for living this life. That if we're going to live in this world, here's how we ought to live this life. And so he talks about things like living under authority. He talks about things like we can't expect to know everything, to understand everything. It's just not going to happen that way. He talks about realizing the only thing the world can offer, a fallen world can offer, is death. That's it. He talks about things like we need to enjoy the life that God has given us and enjoy life by remember, but also remember that we're going to be held accountable for how we live. And then ultimately, he, he kind of leaves us with this notion in Ecclesiastes that don't wait till you're old to get the right perspective. I feel like at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon realizes that his perspective on life, his perspective on satisfaction was all messed up. And he waited way too long in his life to get it right. So that's the book of Ecclesiastes. And then last of all, I want to talk about the Song of Songs. Just quickly about the Song of Songs. You can go back and read. It's a beautiful, beautiful beautiful book. I, I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon series preached through it because of the nature of the book, but what I want to know this is that the Song of Songs was written by Solomon. Most scholars would say a young Solomon, and it's a, basically an, it's elegantly, it's an elegant kind of celebration of love is what it is. It's beautiful. The way it's written, the poetic nature of it, it's just beautiful as it talks about the, 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 these two people that love one of these two lovers that come together that have been created in the image of God who bask in the beauty and the glory of the other person. There's nothing filthy, there's nothing dirty, there's nothing perverted about the Song of Songs. It's the beauty of two that have become one basking the beauty of one another, the beauty that God has created. And so it's a picture of the majesty, and I think it's, a, it's a kind of the picture of the majesty of a monogamous love, a love that is honoring and a love that ultimately is faithful. Now, here's why the Song of Songs is something worth mentioning in this moment, is because I think the Song of Songs is really an antidote to what we see in the world today. I think the Song of Songs, if we really read it and we really understood it, really spent time in it, we would find out it's an antidote for what we see in the world today. It's an antidote for what we see in our country as it relates to sexual perversion. I mean, the beauty of Song of Songs is not what we see reflected in the world today. The world today is, I mean, the magazines, the, 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 the TV shows, the ads, I mean, all of it is sexual perversion. So we bring that notion to Song of Songs and we feel like it's perverted, but it's not. It's an animal. It shows the beauty of sexuality, the beauty of the two becoming one, the beauty of being created in the image of Christ, and the two become one, the beauty of marriage, the monogamous marriage. And so it's an antidote. It's also an antidote for the decay that we see in the institution of marriage today. We see marriages declining and decaying all over the place, and the Song of Songs should be a reminder of the beauty of the, 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 the institution of marriage. But also, it's a beauty, beautiful antidote and picture of what it means for the two to become one. You know, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, go you not with his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. Now, when you say that among junior high boys, you get a lot of giggles, right? And, Ugh! But it's a beautiful thing. The two becoming one, sexuality and the, and the act of two becoming one was created by God. God created it for procreation and for pleasure. He wanted husbands and wife to jo enjoy the beauty of his creation. And you see that in the Song of Songs. Now, as we go through these, these books of wisdom, uh, literature, and this, this poetry, I want to give us some takeaways. And I want to take each book and just give us a couple of takeaways for some things for us to write down. First of all, the book of Psalms. I think when you read the book of Psalms, one of the key takeaways of this is that there is value in just pouring your heart out to God. There's value in just pouring it out. When you read Psalms, you just see people pouring it out, pouring out praise, pouring out thanksgiving, pouring out hurt, pouring out sorrow. They are just pouring themselves out. So when you read Psalms, I pray that it inspires us to spend time, maybe even daily, pouring out our hearts to God. It also, the book of Psalms, reminds us of the need to always give thanks. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I spend more of my time when I'm praying, asking God for what I need, than thanking him for what he's done for me. And I would just say this, shame on me. And I think as we read the book of Psalms, yes, we should pour our heart to God, but we also should remember a large portion of that pouring out should be pouring out our gratitude, pouring out our thanksgiving. Listen, here's what I know about Doug. Here's what I know about everybody watching. It's this, is that we are wretched, pathetic sinners that have been saved by grace.
And may I never get over my salvation. May I never get over that I was destined to spend eternity apart from Christ. But because of Jesus dying on the cross and me putting my faith in him, now I have the hope of glory. May I never forget and may my gratitude well up in me every day as I think about the price that Jesus has paid for me. So that's the book of Psalms, some takeaways. Takeaways from the book of Proverbs, I think, is that first of all, that we, if we're going to live in this world the way God wants us to live, we need his wisdom. Not wisdom that we can muster up on our own, but wisdom that comes from his throne. Not the wisdom of our friends, not the wisdom of our opinions, our experiences, or our biasness, but wisdom that comes from God. If we're going to live in this world and truly love God and love people, we need God's wisdom, not our wisdom. And then Ecclesiastes, a couple of takeaways of this, that this world will never satisfy us. Only Jesus can. This world never will satisfy the greatest longing of our heart. Only Jesus can do that. And that this world and how it functions, I know it's frustrating. I know that as we go through this world, there's frustration, just like Solomon felt. But we must remember this, that God has a season and a reason for everything. And we must refuse to let this world rob us of that joy. So take that away from Ecclesiastes. And last of all, the Song of Songs. I think the key takeaway there is this, is that the Song of Songs remind us of the beauty of the marriage relationship. One that is filled with intimacy, one that is filled with longing, and one that is filled with deep knowing. Now listen to me. But also reminds us of the beauty of the relationship we have with Christ. See, the Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. And the Song of Songs should be a mirror image of the relationship between a husband and wife and us to our Savior. A relationship of deep spiritual intimacy a relationship of deep longing to be closer to him, and a relationship of deep knowing who he is and how much he cares for us. So I praise you you should think about this, this different wisdom literature and this different bits of poetry that you would learn what the, the overtones of these books are, but would you just think about the takeaways, the takeaway from the Psalms, the takeaway from Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. Because all these happen during the season that United Monarchy, which will set us up for next week when we talk about a kingdom that is divided. So let's pray together. God, I love you. I thank you for this moments that we've had together. I just pray as we go through this. I know that, that in these books, there's, it's not really stories of narrative. We don't see a lot of things that take place that lead us from one point to the next. But I hope we gain this understanding that in this wisdom literature, in this poetry, between these different books that we've discussed, that what we see is the heart of mankind that occurred during that united monarchy for the most part. We see the heart of David as he reigned and ruled as king. We see him as an old man reflecting back on his life in Psalms. We see Solomon, who was the wisest man to live there in that day. And we see the Proverbs as a middle-aged man who gives us the wisdom that comes from your throne about how to navigate life and situations and relationships and, and, and how, to, how to live within law and how to live and, you know, and, and to manage wealth. And God, I thank you for that. And I thank you for Ecclesiastes that, God, whether we want to admit or not, there's times we feel that way. But may we be reminded that you have a season and a reason for everything, that you're on your throne and that we refuse to let the world rob us of our joy. But God, I also thank you for Song of Songs. I pray that we would take away some things from that. The beauty of the marriage between a husband and wife is also a reflection of the beauty between our relationship with you as you are the groom and we are, we, we are the bride of Christ. The intimacy we should have with you, the longing we should have to know you, and the deep knowing we want with you. So God, I thank you for this time. I pray that we would understand these books in a chronological way, in context where they belong, but we'd also understand them in a very passionate spiritual way of what these books can mean to us and that we might take some of these takeaways and implement them into our lives. So God, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. And it's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen and amen.